Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining, joining in for the session with Melanjana Roy on her latest book, Black River. It's an honor to be here with you, ma'am. And um, firstly, massive congratulations on the success of your new Noi fiction, now, which also kind of wanders into other territories like literary fiction. Um, so could we just begin by hearing you talk about the book? It is really a pleasure to be uh, in a state that has its fair share of crime, good crime writers and good crime writing. And uh, as far as I was concerned, Black River basically, it had a long genesis. Uh, it started about six years ago. And uh, I was on the gender beat with the New York Times at that time. And I think what I was seeing was basically a landscape of murders, absences, a lot of killings that went unremarked because they were by and large the killings of young women, girls, but they were not so dramatic, you know, or so shocking that they caught the nation's interest. But very often, my work took me to places like police stations and morgues, and I started to understand that everybody had a human face, you know? The police were not always the monsters they were made out to be, though sometimes what they uh, did, the choices and the decisions that they made to cover up a crime uh, were fairly ambiguous. And I met a lot of grieving parents, I met a lot of grieving families, and one of them stood out to me. I was uh, covering a terrible rape murder in Jind, uh, near Haryana. This young girl who'd gone for her exams, been waylaid by a gang of boys and she never came back home. And that unfortunately was one of the biggest stories of India in those times, uh, we're talking about the 1990s, 2000s, as more and more women stepped into the workforce, especially into North India, and as more and more women started to step out in order to join college or something of the sort, what they were met with was a wall of unorganized but very real violence, you see? And the man I met out there was so unobtrusive that at first I thought he was just one of the helpers in the police station. You know, because he would greet grieving families or families in shock or survivors who just didn't know that they were going to have to jump through a system now uh, on the quest for justice. And he'd say, okay, this is where you go. You go and speak to that constable. Don't go to the police station after 5 p.m. They'll have no time for you. This is how you get a medical examination done. And I was giving him a lift back to his village. And I said, sir, it's wonderful that you work with the police this way. And he said, actually, ma'am, many years ago, I lost my daughter in uh, this sort of way. And it was a case, it turned out, where her killers were very powerful. And uh, there was no question of him even approaching the system for justice. And this is what he did with his time. He went around trying to see whether, if he couldn't get justice for himself, maybe he could get it for somebody else, okay? But what he said to me, somebody said, you've been carrying that grief around for all those years. And he said, if I put down the grief, then I let go of the love, you know? So I think a lot of the seeds for Black River, crime fiction, often you think of, you know, blood and guts and murders. But behind that, what I was seeing were families that were shattered and left to put their pieces back together. And I was left with a, with a sense of an absence of the lives these girls and these women would not grow up to lead. You see? Um, so there's so much that I want to unpack one by one there. Like, you know, there's so much in what you said about, you know, the medical establishment on one side, silences, long-term impacts of grief, and the policeman and, and the conscience and that vulnerable side. Um, and I think we can see it in one of the characters, Ambir Singh. Um, and, and, you know, um, so I think we can see that, you know, it's as much influenced by some of the real instances that you've had to confront or... Uh, from your experience as a journalist. So I'm going to ask this one by one. Now, because you mentioned this idea of pursuit of justice whilst unraveling that murder mystery, um, I think I sort of hinted it to you, this idea of activism. 
when you know all the formal discussions or scholarly debates are not really understandable to a lot of people. Now, their fiction has a reach to everyone, like you know, people who are going back after work, you know, you see people reading on the train. Now, I think one of the fascinating things that this book does is to explore this idea of uh, talking about justice through stories. Now, although it's a murder mystery, you have fabulously focused on the realities and conflicts and, um, you know, the hate politics of the time. So what do you have to say about that as a journalist reconciling a fictional world as a novelist? Well, you know, when you're writing fiction, you're writing with a great deal of freedom. And one thing I didn't want to do was to write an editorial. Uh, because if you start writing in anger or of a quest for justice, that's fine for you, but that uh, doesn't give the reader very much to work with. But the moment that you turn it to the human side of things, I think one of the reasons why we all gathered here, why we all seem to love books so much, is because books really move us, right? They have that power, a novel or a short story. It can make you travel outside of yourself and feel a different kind of life. And uh, for me, a book allows you to do many things at the same time and to be many people at the same time. You know, Kerala, when I look at your beautiful state, one of the things that's in my mind always is that, um, thankfully, you're not a, very, a state of very high crime or very high injustices, but you are a state that has a huge population of migrants. And when I was writing Black River, I'd lived in Delhi for 27 years. And to me, you know, Delhi, the story of Delhi is the partition happened and then people came in and they started to settle the city as refugees. And behind that, you've got many centuries of history and empires and all of that. But I was walking this book into existence. You know, I think when we talk about research, we think of a diligent writer sitting in archives. But often what happens is that if you walk around, if you're willing to have conversations that are slightly outside of your own set of friends, your own set of people, then uh, you're taken also to a different view of your city. And I started to understand that as with Kerala, as with Delhi, as with many other states, two things are true. One is that in Delhi, we've lost it. and in, in Kerala, I hope you never lose it. But we are losing or have lost our connection with the land, the sea, the rivers. You know, the places that are really the lifeblood of any human settlement. And I have a family of migrants, uh, friends, you know, people who come to the city and uh, who make friends on the banks of the Yamuna, which in the 90s was unremarkable. Nobody wanted to settle there. There was malaria, fever, and it was wild land, you know, jungly land. But when you settle in a place like that, you are also free to go beyond boundaries of what's your caste, go and sit with the rest of them. You come from Tamil Nadu to Delhi, then go to that colony. You come from Bengal, you go to Chitranjan Park, right? Somewhere on the banks of the river historically, um, and in Kerala in many places, you find that migrants might cluster together, but a lot of the freedom of the state also depends on people beginning to move in and to assimilate and create friendships that are sometimes just not possible, right, outside of this. And that became an intriguing strand. I, I say this often about the literary thriller. Um, a lot of my editors, I, it, I find it fascinating that books are classified as different things, you know, in different countries. So in India, Black River is seen as noir fiction. And in the UK, it's apparently a crime thriller. And in the US, it is this wonderful thing, a literary thriller, which basically means that nobody can make their minds up about <laughs> what it is. But I started off by reading a lot of Indian writers. I'm going off topic a little bit. And reading books like, uh, you must have read something called Miss Miller's Feeling for Snow in this classic Scandinavian thriller that came out more than 20 years ago. And at some point, if you read a lot of thrillers, you realize this is not a book, this is a hold-all. There's so much that you can put into it, you know? 
So you can put in a little history of the city that you love. You mentioned the um, tension, the rising tension. The book set in 2017, which was just a few years into you know, this current regime. And at that point, what was happening, we were feeling the first flickers of it. In a big city, you know how it is, people find a way to live together. You know, it's amazing how wherever you go, people tend to break down boundaries. It's a natural instinct. And that was coming under threat. So, um, Black River has many rivulets in it, all sort of flowing together, you know, ultimately as a river. So, I just want to take you back to that um, conversation on migration and um, also the city. So, so, let's just sort of start by talking about Delhi. So, the Delhi and the river are two prominent, maybe perhaps characters in itself, isn't it? So, could you comment on that? a little further, as in say, for example, keep in mind, for example, references to the Pabri Masjid um, incident on one side, for example. Mm -hmm. Also as, you know, the place where the three migrants meet and they develop a friendship and the story of that. And also when you talk about it, I think I'm sort of mixing up some of these aspects. Mm -hmm. The reason being the whole, say for example, when we read stories about the American dream, for example, you know, there is a dream despite all the ordeals and the struggles and everything. Yep. The same way, I'm trying to sort of draw a parallel between uh, the mm -hmm. two. The same way, your novel is not just without romanticizing it or without sort of, you know, um, ignoring or discrediting the struggles. There is a dream and there is a focus. And that mm -hmm. friendship on the banks, you know, of the river sort of talks, is, talks about that. So, I think... There's one of my characters, he's a man called Chand, he's a farmer on the banks uh, in Haryana, in a little village called Titarpur, which is famous for nothing and very proud of it. You know, it's a little suspicious of the big city, turns it by its backs on Delhi and doesn't want to have anything to do with it. But as a young man, Chand comes to Delhi and he's standing on the ITO bridge, which is a huge traffic, that's where all the train stations and everything come in. And he's captivated because, you know, what he sees as a young man is his dream and a lot of other people's dreams hovering in the air. And it just feels that you're breathing in a thousand dreams and breathing them out again. And Delhi as a place, you know, all of us who live there are perversely proud of the fact that the people are aggressive, the air is polluted and the city is trying to kill you, you know, <laughs> every single day. The politicians are terrible. <laughs> And uh, the winter is really cold and foggy and the summer is really hot. And at the same time, why are we there? We are there because you can come from anywhere and find a place of belonging in Delhi. And I was wondering, do you want me to read a small section from the Yamuna bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. And thank you so much for, you know, hanging in there through all of this. It's so good to be talking to an audience in Trivandrum. I was looking at Trivandrum and Kochi though, I was in Kochi a little while back. And you know, my memory of both of uh, these wonderful towns was from some years ago. And it's a shock sometimes to realize that you also face pollution, you also have growing traffic problems. I went down to the sea yesterday and I think you know, those of us who live in very polluted places are almost hungry for what you have, and we often want to just tell you, preserve it, because in my case, I saw Delhi change over a very short period of time, you know? So, this is when Rabia, Chand, and Khalid have come up to the Yamuna, just a second. Do you know rivers, I mean, uh, the first time I came uh, many years ago, this was when I was in my teens, and I came to uh, this part of the country, fell in love immediately, and I mentioned my name, Neela. And everybody said, oh, Neela, you're a river, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I felt very welcomed. I have a thing about water and rivers. So, the Yamuna is the city's watery border, a river that carries a memory of clouds and ice down from the Himalayas of glacier gray beauty an unpolluted water is the color of storm clouds in a mountain sky, a dancing river before she reaches the plains. 
For the most part, Delhi turns its back on her, staining her swollen body with its ashes and garbage and sewage, choking her with the city's waste, its discards, its corpses and diseases. Most inhabitants notice the river goddess's turbulence only when she floods her banks, returning to the city all that it had discarded and dumped in her once clear waters. But the river still exerts a half-felt pull on the capital's subconscious, infecting its citizens with watery dreams and silted nightmares from time to time. River of sorrows, river of tears, the river that swallows the world's poisons, Khalid sings to Rabia and Chand. She bears them in her own flowing body until even her waters can carry no more. An invisible tide courses through the city, Chan knows. Every morning, the tide sends in a flood of people who work to build Delhi's roads and homes, to guard the factories and the offices of the wealthy, sends in artisans and laborers, armies of domestic workers and clerks, mill workers and gardeners. And every evening, the tide ebbs, casting them back outside the city, strewn like human debris. Across the river banks, the floodplains, the unstable tides that appear in islands that appear in one season and vanish or broaden in time. Khaled has a river and nature. He's ruled by his own mysterious tides. They pull him this way and that way, never allowing him to settle into one thing. He drifts in and out of several jobs, tiring of the rigors of the loader's life and taking up carpentry. Then he quarrels with the master carpenter and joins a road crew to fill in potholes, leaves that for a brief stint uh, stringing cotton for a mattress maker. Often, he quits working altogether except for odd jobs here and there. But he has a rare gift for coaxing fish from the murky waters, and he trades his cash uh, for a few handfuls of rice or red chilies or some cooking oil. He fishes, forages, plays his feud, uh, whittles toys and startling lifelike animals from bits of wood. Chand learns to cook rice from Khalid and Rabia, easier than making rotis every day. That dish, fermented rice, pantabhat, will see him through his daily life. And Chand learns to love it all, the ebb and the flow, the sense of riding the tides, of being one of those who survives Delhi's harshness, and is rewarded by an immersion in a more urgent flow of life than he has ever imagined possible. So, the same river as the source of dreams, but also nightmares. Um, so could you just sort of tell us about, I mean, for me, the Black River sort of, considering the fact that it's the title, kind of sort of brings to it, uh, for me, it's like multiple themes coming in and going with it. Also the depth, the darkness is suggested by, you know, the adjective black. So there are so many things that the ter this term embodies. So could you comment on that, keeping in mind, you know, what you've just read? I just want to say that I'm so grateful to be in conversation with uh, someone like Parvati. You know, she's not just one of your best scholars, but she's a fantastic reader. And I love it that you didn't associate black only with grimness and with, you know, murder and the murkier side of people's characters. It is really, I was, I walked the banks of the Yamuna a lot and I still remember the first time that I did that. It's unremarkable for all of you, you have the backwaters out here. But in the middle of a city like Delhi, you walk five paces through a Kikar forest, you suddenly see the nose of a camel pop out, okay? And uh, you go down and find yourself on this plain with horses around, with marigold farmers, with children playing cricket. It's a completely different world. And uh, I wasn't prepared for how alive the Yamuna was. You know, it had taken so much pollution, so much. There's parts of the river that I walked where it had choked up completely, you know. And it's a sad thing to see a river dying like that. But it keeps stubbornly, it's a Himalayan river, you know. It has a force and a power to it and it keeps coming back to life. And somewhere in those, you know, what you call the depths and the darkness, there's a stillness behind every murder, even if it's done in the heat of the moment or an impulse. What happens is that it's like, especially in small communities, you know this, 
A murder disrupts everything, not just the family or the survival. It's like a stone thrown into that, and once the water settles, it reveals something. So Black River actually opens with three crimes, not just one. The body of a woman who's not valued, you know, because uh, she's a dancer, it's a dodgy profession, uh, she used to do slightly dangerous things aside from her dancing. And there's very little interest in solving. It's almost as though her life was not even worth uh, remarking on. Then there's uh, the second murder, which is grievous and which uh, was difficult to write, actually. I think by then, as a reporter, I was burning out. Uh, I know we are supposed to say, oh, journalism is great, and I saw so much, and I won these human rights awards, and everything was fantastic about the life. But the truth is that I admire journalists who are objective. I'm not. I tend to get involved with people with communities, and I think I've just seen too many, uh, too many bodies of children, particularly young girls. It, it hit me at my heart. And the third set of crimes isn't about a murder at all. It's a very commonplace crime. It's, uh, you know, people casually exploiting a set of children in the village with everybody looking the other way. And I think the first draft that I wrote of this didn't work because I was writing out of my anger. And uh, that doesn't work. You have to get to a place of clarity to some extent. Again, I watered a bit, but... I think when you mentioned about striking, you know, the journalistic background in this bit, I have three things which address three specific things that you said, um, of which one is, you know, how is it, how is it that you balance that, you know, the background of the journalist and the creativity of the writer, one thing. The second thing is also, this, being a journalist, you also speak about the whole politics of making headlines, um, and particularly when reporting grief, um, and that, that's one thing. And the third thing is about that sensitivity that you just spoke about. You know, I'm, I'm not a journalist who's very objective, but I'm somebody uh, who gets, involved. gets, a, gets yeah. involved. So that bit is something that's very evident in the novel. Like, everything you describe, it, it's not dogmatic, but it's also not from, it's, it's also very sensitive about what is being talked about. So can you sort of comment on, was it like a very meticulous, engaging process? Um, so this is something that I would like to ask you about. Uh, I think the process was basically trying to get myself out of the way. I had interesting characters, and it's a funny thing, you know, this whole business about writing fiction. Um, I think all of us who walk into writing are a little mad, and we have been for centuries, for as long as there are writers. Uh, as a profession, it's wonderful to be at a festival as such, but this is a profession that requires you to spend a lot of your time not on your own, but a lot of time in active conversation with imaginary characters who are very, very real. And uh, the process was basically, a lot of it was combining the journalistic side of me, which was research, but also finding a way to just let the imagination flow. You know, you never sit down and say, I'm going to write a book about injustice and rural policing. If you did that, I think it wouldn't work. But when you write a book about a father's grief and the fact that he's left to carry that grief for the rest of his life, you know, that's something, there are so few families out here who have not at some point either lost a loved one or it's terrible if you lose a child or they know somebody who's lost a child. That's a human experience, that's a universal experience. I grew very fond of the two policemen in the book, Ombir and Bhim Singh, not because they were particularly good people, um, but they're pretty ambiguous. Sometimes they do good, sometimes they don't. But Ombir particularly, he just likes to know, you know, he has that burning desire to know what the truth really is. He's a little on the fence about justice. He's been in a Delhi and Haryana police person for a while. And he's like, justice is, everyone comes in and talks about it and gives big speeches about it. And in the middle of all of this, I think one of the things that 
I flinched from. I was a print journalist, so I had the luxury of being able to go into people's houses and speak to them over a period of time. Not every TV crew, some of them were sensitive. But murders were celebrated as sansani kahani, you know, these uh, shocking things. And people would, the poorer the family, uh, or if they were from a lower caste, or if they were in any way underprivileged, you would have TV crews just walking in and sitting themselves down in the middle of somebody's, you know, home and saying, you know, how do you feel? Your child has just been killed. Do you feel bad about this? And uh, it's not the journalist's fault. It's what they've been taught. But that is not what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to go there and take people's, you know, most private moments. And uh, I don't have to say it. I saw enough people push back against that and say, you know, politely, what kind of family do you come from? When you had a death in your family, you know, did you deal with this in this way? But one of the things that's where writing a novel is very different from writing, you know, an 800-word piece for the New York Times or the Financial Times or something, is that you can layer in everything. There's a lot of laughter in the book because your characters insist also on uh, being happy in the middle of darkness. Um, now, another interesting thing about this book is how there's no hero as such, is it? So it kind of very deliberately, you know, moves away from that tendency to say, for example, discuss the detec detective as a hero or to sort of, you know, some kind of discussion of the bereaved as a hero. There, is, there's, there isn't that tendency. So it kind of, like you said, just what you mentioned about the police, none of them being extremely good or extremely bad, they're on the fence. So how do you sort of think about the characters, all the characters in the book, and then sort of, could you discuss that? Okay, heroes, except for Shah Rukh Khan, maybe Rajneekant, are really boring. <laughs> You know, the moment a hero walks in, it, in a film, heroes are great. But the moment a hero walks into a novel, then you know, yeah, you know what the story is. It's got a straight tra trajectory. Detective has a heart of gold. You know, most of the police officers I met, and of course, um, we shouldn't take this lightly. There are some states, including my own, where the police have now been used by the state as a very, very brutal force. Uh, they've given that kind of power. But we're talking about 2015 to 2017, and most of the police officers I met, their feet hurt. They hated paperwork. They had permanent tension with the family at some level or the other because either, you know, somebody was saying, you know, the parents or the wife were saying, you don't spend enough time with us. And uh, cops work insane hours, you know, often their lives can go from boredom to working for 18 to 25 hours. And I think I kept my judgment out of this. And I said, what happens when you have a place where everybody, even somebody who you like and who you're feeling your heart is torn in pieces for because he's gone through a terrible loss, but what if nobody is heroic, you know? And to me, the human is much more interesting. Every single day, they're little choices we make. We don't sit up in the morning, most of us, and say, we want to be good people, or conversely, except for my, one of my youngest nephews, who wakes up routinely and says, today I am going to be a monster, you know? But most of us don't consciously decide that we're going to be evil. And those little choices under pressure, which way are you going to go? That's much more interesting to me when somebody accidentally commits an act of courage knowing that it's going to harm his career prospects, you know? And that's what a lot of noir fiction actually is about. It's about, it goes back to old plays and stuff, it's about allowing you to explore what it means to have many choices, not all of them are the right ones, and doing the right thing sometimes is hard. Does that mean when you know that somebody has done terrible crimes and intends to continue doing that, is it okay to put him in hospital? But you're never going to get him in the courts, no? So then what? 
Um, so I'm just going to switch to another aspect of this. So despite being a murder mystery, it's a focus is more on why done it rather than who has done it. <laughs> so and I think that's one of the yeah. most interesting things or the most talked about aspects of the novel. Could you comment on that? I think this one has uh, puzzled a lot of readers. You know, if you grew up with the Agatha Christie and the Bumkish Boom, Bakshi kind of uh, mysteries, then you fully expect to have a who done it. That's what a thriller is. But about approximately, I think, 30, 40 years ago, that started to be blown up. And the choice rests with you both as a writer and a reader. Um, I find the who done it part of it uh, reasonably uninteresting, unless I'm in the hands of a very gifted writer. But the whole question of uh, here you are, you as the reader can see something that maybe the characters out there can't see. You know, you know something. And you can guess maybe who the murderer is out of three people. Mm. You guess maybe right or wrong, but the point is that you have information that the people on the stage don't. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it starts to get much more interesting, interesting. much richer. So, um, I'm sort of trying to sort of uh, read this text against the backdrop of the society in which we live. And I think, um, this one bit I want to add here, which is about the emphasis on intersectionality in, you know, in popular discourse at the moment, you know, where you, you are try to understand things not just on the basis of, say, for example, class or caste or gender, but you're trying to sort of understand how they intersect. Yeah, so this is something that's been studied a lot at the moment, but it remains a lot distant from lived realities or, you know, conversations between people. I think this fiction, this book sort of, does it so beautifully and in a very relatable way. And coming to that bit is this novel's potential to speak about or to sort of focus attention on atrocities that go unregistered or unnoticed and, and how a lot of people escape due to lack of evidence and also due to privileges. So how do you think the novel sort of presents a social critique based on that? I think if you write crime fiction in India at some point, you're going to go into both of this. What do we mean by intersectionality? You know, At its simplest, we mean that the way that people, their lives is connected. It doesn't matter what religion you come from, in a sense, or what community you come from. At some point, you know, your life is surrounded by other lives, right? And uh, you're trying to, as a person, you can never be that distant from the web of your relationships. Uh, in terms of a social critique, uh, I think a lot of thriller novels do this. We've had a Swedish crime showcase out here uh, during the time of the festival. And inevitably, if you're writing crime, what are you writing about? You're writing about communities, you're writing about your neighborhood, you're writing about the simple thing of whether people feel safe or whether after a period of they've learned to belong in a certain place, right? And uh, is that belonging under threat, you know? So that becomes one of the big yeah. questions of Black River. So um, now I think most discussions sort of focus just thematically, and I just wanted to take some bits of the novel out and to sort of ask you about the structure. There's a lot, that go, lot of effort that goes into the structure. And also I think one of the best things about the novel is just the the beauty of the, the language, the descriptions, the vivid details of the characters. And I think that was one of the most interesting things for me. And I, it was just really hard not to sort of uh, take some of the excerpts and to comment on the nature of language that you've used. Uh, say, for example, the use of contrast to highlight some bits. So would you mind if I read some bits um, and ask you to comment on it? I'd be really touched. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the first one is about um, the sort of description of the, of the setting, Delhi. Delhi is brutal, a city where even the crows have a calculating glint in their eyes and will snatch a piece of bread from out of their fellows' beaks. So I'd like you to sort of think about, you know, what you had in mind, uh, that, that calculating glint and that, um, and that sort of a tendency to snatch something from the next person. So, When I moved to Delhi, which was many years ago, and in between, I've 
move briefly to the Himalayas. I spent a couple of years living very happily in Goa uh, before the rest of Delhi and Bombay joined in. When I came to Delhi, the thing that the city does almost immediately is it is harsh. You know, it doesn't matter what class you come from, it, it, it's all, everybody seems to have a rough start in the city. But once you get past that, you know, then you find a little bit of softness. And this sentence was written from the point of view of Rabia, I think, or Chand, you know. People, when they come to the city for the first time, you walk out of the railway station and your pocket is picked. We're very efficient that way. You know? oh, okay, okay, now I get yeah. it. Uh, now also, in some parts of the novel, like there are names of places which sound very optimistic, which turn out to be very grim places. Um, so for example, Hope Building is a grim, gray place. Sunlight Colony is pressed up against a massive industrial buildings and old mills, and Welcome is a closed maze of narrow, rough paved lanes, forbidding concrete sheds, open drains, and half-installed electric wiring. This has been a deadly feature since the 1980s. Welcome Colony actually dates back to that point. And uh, the way I look at it is, uh, can I share something personal? When I was a kid in school, nursery school, I used to like playing at home, and I had a great objection to going to school. And I just knew that the moment that a school had a name like Happy Place or, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the cheery and happy something or the other, I just knew that they were going to make you sit down and do multiplication for three hours. You know? So I don't trust names always. Yeah, okay, the politics of naming. Um, yeah, so the next bit actually is an excerpt which you know, speaks to the broader um, issue of Islamophobia at present. But I think, um, I think this is one of those paragraphs that really stood out to me. Uh, because of that intersection of, say, for example, capital and, um, and religion, for example, and, you know, how one can use the influence to sort of, um, you know, get rid of those who, quote-unquote, don't belong. Mm -hmm. And it kind of sort of sets a, a demarcation, right? I think this is one of the important novels uh, when you think about, say, for example, the fight for home and businesses being affected on the grounds of religion and, and those, those aspects. So I just, considering the importance of this topic, I think, what are some thoughts that went into that particular aspect that you were describing? I think there was, um, I made some unexpected friendships. And I think one of the first lectures I got on, you know, we often talk about this thing called privilege. We acknowledge our privilege or whatever. But one of the places where I was really forced to acknowledge it was Every time I went into one of Delhi's big slums, and some of them have been around almost as long as, you know, Bombay's Dharavi, they have their own characters. I was welcomed quite warmly by the women, but they would just look at me and say, you need to know that your life is very different from mine. And the difference did not lie in the fact that the simple surface stuff, you know, there would be water flowing in the taps when I went back home, I wouldn't have to queue up at a tanker, I had a safer life than them because I walked into places speaking Pakka and Grezi, then automatically every cop, every, you know, roadside loafer knows how, okay, don't mess with her, she might be from someone, media or someone important or whatever it is, right? The biggest difference was that I lived a life of security, you know? I had the expectation at the end of the day when I went back that my house would still be standing there and no matter what your personal troubles are, you know that because of the class or caste or income level you come from, you won't fail beyond a certain point. Once this was established and I started to understand that people who live there um, live very happy lives but against this background of insecurity, all your friendships, all your aspirations for your children come up against that, right? And a line that's not in the book, but my friend Kulsum told me this. She said, the difference is that you and your kind of people, media, you know, South Delhi types, all of that, you're tikau. Tikau means you're stable, you're there to stay. Said, we are like paper cups, we're disposable. They can shift us anywhere, anytime. Uh, so there are some questions which, I mean, I couldn't stop thinking about one of 
the major ones was um, there's always this clash between a critical voice and a creative voice. And you're a reviewer as well, isn't it? Um, reviewer, you, you're a reviewer as well and a critic. So how do you reconcile those, you know, critical voice and the creative writer? And I'm referring sort of your, to your previous works as well, fantasy and now crime fiction. Um, I'd like you to sort of talk about that. Oh, uh, as in how do I, am I critical of my own writing? I can't judge my own writing, you know. All of us writers, we go through the same phase. Artists are not as bad as this. But what happens is that you sit there, you find the time, your imagination works, and you produce your first draft, and you are literally like, ho oh, oh, ho, this is my baby, this is my perfect child. Look, look at her, you know, they're not a blemish. Going to grow up to be a Nobel Prize win winning genius. That's how you feel. What you need to do at that point of time is take everything that you've written, take a printout, put it in a drawer, and don't touch it, don't go back to it for two months. At the end of those two months, you're going to look at your own work and say, my God, how could I have written these sentences? I mean, who, who made me a writer? This is so bad. So I have no critical faculties whatsoever until at least two to three months have passed. But I realized a long time ago, we've talked so much about writing at this festival. And uh, you have to love the process of writing and not be too uh, precious about it. What keeps me going is difficult to explain, but if you stay with your story long enough, at some point you can visualize it, you know? And you can see it as clearly as you see everybody in this auditorium. It's that vivid. And it's like you're standing in two worlds at the same time. One is this real world where you're book reviewing and writing your columns. And the other is a very loud and very beautiful and very vivid world. And your job is just to be the ferry boat between the two and get it down on paper. That's it.